Hello, this is Daphne, and today I am reading for you the Cape Cod Times for Thursday, June the 20th. We begin with the weather. Today, high of 82, sunny, breezy, and humid. Tonight, low of 67, partly cloudy, breezy, and humid. Friday, high of 81, low of 65, rather cloudy and humid, an evening thunderstorm. Saturday, high of 74, low of 65, mostly cloudy and humid. Sunday, high of 79, low of 68, breezy and humid with high clouds. And Monday, high of 80, low of 65, a couple of afternoon thunderstorms and windy. And today, the sun rose at 5.07 a.m. and sets at 8.19, giving us 15 hours and 12 minutes of daylight. On to the lottery. We start with the numbers game, drawn yesterday, Wednesday, the 19th of June. The midday drawing was 3346. Again, midday drawing for numbers game 3346. And the evening drawing was 1618. Again, the drawing for the numbers game Wednesday, June 19th, evening was 1618. For Mass Cash, drawn Wednesday, Juneteenth, the numbers are 3, 4, 5, 32, and 35. Again, for Mass Cash, 3, 4, 5, 32, 35. For Powerball, drawn Juneteenth, the numbers are 4, 27, 44, 50, 64, with the Powerball of 7. Again, Powerball, drawn Juneteenth. The numbers are 4, 27, 44, 50, 64, and the Powerball is 7. For Mega Millions, drawn on Tuesday, the 18th of June, the numbers are 21, 22, 50, 55, 67, and the Mega Ball is 20. Again, Mega Millions drawn on June 18th. The numbers are 21, 22, 50, 55, 67, and the Mega Ball is 20. For Mega Bucks drawn yesterday, Juneteenth, the numbers are 5, 17, 34, 36, 39, and 44. Again, Mega Bucks drawn Juneteenth, 5, 17, 34, 36, 39, and 44. And finally, Lucky for Life drawn yesterday, Juneteenth, the numbers are 10, 16, 18, 19, 31, and the Lucky Ball is 10. Again, Lucky for Life, drawn yesterday, Juneteenth. The numbers are 10, 16, 18, 19, 31, and the Lucky Ball is 10. On to the news. Our front page story for the Cape Cod Times is entitled, Hiding in Plain Sight, Historic Quarters offer eye-opening view of slavery in Texas. And this is reported by Michael Barnes of the Austin American Statesman in the USA Today Network. For more than 150 years, the plain limestone building sat mute behind a grand house guarded by white columns on San Gabriel Street in Austin, Texas. Two stories high, the back structure revealed few signifiers of its original employment. During the past few years, however, historian after historian has concluded that this building, which may even antedate the nearby antebellum Greek Revival Mansion, once housed the enslaved workers who built the Neil Cochran House. 
now a museum operated by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of Texas. Quote, I remember the day I realized what the building really was, and what sticks with me is my shock, said Rowena Houghton Dash, the museum's executive director, about the slave quarters. Shock that this part of our history had been hiding in plain sight for decades, and shock that none of us had seen it for what it was. I stood staring down the hall at the back door of the main house at the realization that all that happened on the other side of that door was made possible by the enslavement economy. Close quote. The restored 1856 slave quarters will be reopened Saturday with a ceremony introducing the public to large interpretive panels that, not on, that tell not only the story of the main house and the out structure, but also the background of the people who lived and worked there. News had trickled out about the Neil Cochran slave quarters for years, some skeptics compared the building with other pre-1865 residences for enslaved people that might be older, while others remarked that there was little oral or written history that confirmed the two-story structure was anything other than a general utility building. Then two things happened. A University of Texas class, directed by Tara Dudley, who teaches interior design history and architectural history courses, gathered a small mountain of contextual evidence about the work and life patterns of American, African Americans in Austin before and after emancipation. Then, certified interpretive planner Ted Eubanks expanded and refined those findings into a polished survey. Quote, Historical events and places do not speak for themselves, Eubanks said. Even when basic historical information is on hand, rarely, especially in Austin, is a fully developed interpretive narrative available. People may learn what happened at a historical location and the people involved, but rarely do they learn the all-important why. Close quote. The outdoor interpretive panels that lead to the slave quarters behind the museum cover the history of African slavery in the indigenous, Spanish, Mexican, and Anglo-American eras. In, panel, in a panel a panel including enslaved Estevan, who reached Texas as a castaway with Spanish explorers 500 years ago. One of the most interesting panels is entitled, quote, Austin, where slavery came to die but didn't, close quote. Using a slave density map, this section delves into the geographic limitations for plantation slavery in the more arid lands west of the 98th parallel, which runs down the center of Austin. Quote, if you look closely at the distribution map of slavery in 1860, you will see that distribution halts at Travis County, Eubanks said. Why? We know that the enslaved were a significant part of the Austin population in its earliest years, but why? Away from the Blackland Prairie to our east, the Balconies Escarpment did not support a plantation economy. Why were there so many slaves here? Who were they? And how did they contribute to the building of early Austin? Close quote. Slavery did reach Austin, the Austin area, even before the city was founded in 1839. Quote, in, 1987, in 1837, William Barton brought the first enslaved people to the Austin area, although outside of Austin proper, one panel reads. However, Mahala Merchinson, a 10-year-old mulatto girl, came to Austin with her enslavers four months after Austin was founded. Close quote. While Barton lived outside the new capital city, the panel explains, Murchison lived in the center of the new town. The panels go to length to describe the living conditions for urban slaves, 
as opposed to those who worked on plantations, including a list of the types of jobs they held, some skilled, some not. In 1855, master designer and builder Abner Cook, who built the governor's mansion, among other Austin landmarks, began putting together what was then known as the Washington and Mary Hill House. Cook designed the home, perched on more than 17 acres on the west edge of Austin. He and enslaved craftsmen, both owned and rented, also built the quarters behind the big house. It turned out that the Hills could not afford the grand home and sold five of the people they enslaved to help complete the project. Before the work was done, the Hills sold the buildings and property to investors Swante Swenson and James Monroe Fisher, whose family owned a farm in South Austin. The duo then leased the property to the state of Texas to serve as the Texas State Asylum for the Blind. Asylum students and teachers were the site's first occupants. According to research by Dudley, the residents included at least six hired-out enslaved people who not only did tasks such as hauling water, but also taught the students skills, such as basket weaving. In 1876, the family of Andrew and Jenny Neal moved into the big house as its first owner-occupants. Neal and his family, who were new to Austin, lived in the former Hill House until 1892. In 1892, Thomas Cochran rose to a position on the federal bench that brought him, his wife, three young children, and his wife's parents to Austin. The family first leased, then purchased the site from Jenny Neal in 1895. The Cochran family lived there for 65 years. Neither the Neals nor the Cochrans enslaved people on this property, yet freed men and freed women who worked for these families were still unequal citizens of the community. They faced black codes that attempted to control the movement of African Americans. Jim Crow laws that kept them out of positions of power, and in the early 20th century, increased segregation in housing, employment, education, and basic amenities. As the interpretive panels make clear, only with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Act, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act did, quote, freedom begin to become a reality for black residents, close quotes. Without this kind of context, as well as ongoing education and events, the Neil Cochran House would become, at least to some visitors, just a nicely preserved mansion with beautifully arranged period furniture and decor. Quote, this is why these interpretive efforts are so critical, Eubanks said. These storylines are Austin's roots. Once cut, Austin is untethered, easily swept away in the latest economic and social changes, and easily replaced by other cities that are similarly ephemeral and soulless. Close quote. Dash agreed, quote, The heart of Austin beats here. Who we are today as a city is predicated on how we got here, and so many of the complexities of that history have intersected with this place, she said. The fact that we steward the only intact and accessible slave dwelling left in Austin is a critical piece of that history. And there are some pictures that accompany this article. The first is a historic picture of the house with a horse-drawn carriage in front of it, and that is has been provided by the Neil Cochran House Museum. And then there are modern pictures, one of the house now in modern day. Many pedestrians who have walked past the Neil Cochran House Museum in Austin, Texas, didn't have a clue about its history or that of the plain limestone, limestone structure behind it. 
Historians have identified the site as the only intact slave quarters preserved and interpreted in Austin. Thomas Cochran's family first leased, then purchased the site that is now the Neil Cochran House Museum in 1895. And the final black and white photograph behind, uh, underneath that picture uh, shows the back of a house uh, with the interpretive panels. And it shows the plain limestone building with one window facing you. The path leading to the historic slave quarters at the Neil Cochran House in Austin is now lined with large interpretive panels that explain not only the structure, but also the context of slavery in Texas and the capital city. Our next article on the front page these apps will help you track shark activity, reported by Rin Velasco, USA Today Network, New England. Sharks are often thought of as elusive. You won't know they're there until you see a fin sticking out of the water. But did you know there's actually ways to track them and learn more about these iconic sea creatures? Two marine advocacy organizations have created tools to inform the public about shark behavior and movement. They have done this in the form of apps that track sharks and show where areas may have sharks in them. Here are the top two apps used to track sharks in Cape Cod's waters. The environmental nonprofit OSEARCH offers an oceanic awareness app called OSEARCH. Track all of your favorite sharks in near real time on any of your mobile act, uh, devices, the nonprofit's s website says. You can download the iPhone version of the app. You can download the Android version of the app. And the app tracks tagged sharks, all of which have been given names. And the spelling of that app is O C E A R C H. The Atlantic White Shark Conservatory also opts an app, offers an app called Sharktivity. It tracks sharks through devices tagged onto specific sharks in the area and receivers they put in the water. The Conservancy website said that the app was created with input from Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, the Cape Cod National Seashore, and officials from Cape Cod and South Shore towns. Right now, receivers that support the app are out of the water as they are taken in each year to avoid the harsh winter weather. The Conservancy's CEO and co-founder, Cynthia Weigren, said receivers are planted, planned to be back in waters by the end of June. In addition to having the ability to access information on tagged sharks, Sharktivity provides a citizen science component giving the public the opportunity to report white shark sightings that, once vetted, are included on the app, Weigren said. Weigren also said that the tags on sharks that allow tracking do not hurt the sharks or hinder the creature's ability to swim. Quote, the app was created to pr raise awareness about the presence of white sharks off our coast, Weigren said. It should not be used to decide what beaches or part of the water are safe. End quote. To ensure people's safety when entering waters, Weigren said people should remain close to shores where rescues can reach them, stay in groups when in the water, and avoid areas with visibility. She also mentioned other safety tips. And you can download the Sharktivity app on the app, Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Stay safe, cool during extreme heat. Experts recommend adapting daily routine to limit outdoor exposure. And this is reported by Claire Thornton and Olivia Munson for USA Today. Scorching heat is bearing down on large swaths of the U.S., bringing multiple days of temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit and heat advisories for millions from New York, from Ohio to New York to Maine. Humidity will likely make the heat feel hotter in some places, forecasters warn, 
and days of near-record temperatures may strain energy infrastructure, increasing the risk of dangerous power outages that could leave people without air conditioning. During extreme temperatures and heat waves, people may experience dehydration, heat exhaustion, and, in the most extreme cases, heat stroke. Experts say preparing and adapting your daily routine for the prolonged heat can help ensure your health isn't put at risk. As it heats up, and many rely on fans and air conditioning more than ever, here are some tips to, sit, to stay cool. It is important to limit any kind of outdoor activity during the hottest part of the day, said Bianca Fieldkircher lead meteorologist in the National Weather Service in Phoenix. If you can, try to put, out, put off outdoor activities until the morning or later in the day after the sun goes down. Older Americans, people who work outside, and those who take medications for conditions such as heart disease and blood pressure are among those with the highest risk for heat stroke. Dr. Fred Campbell, a professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, told USA Today during a similar mid-June heat wave in 2022. Certain medications, including those to treat schizophrenia, can interfere with the body's ability to regulate temperature. For older Americans, the risk is also high because the ability to regulate body temperatures declines with age, Campbell said. Getting inside and into air conditioning is always helpful to stay cool, along with finding some shade and drinking lots of water. If you live somewhere without air conditioning, experts recommend opening windows at night and closing them before the afternoon heat arrives. Typically, most areas see the hottest weather between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m., that's when it's most important to try to keep cool. According to the Red Cross, av adults should drink on average 96 ounces of liquids a day. When it comes to hydrating, it's best to drink water with added electrolytes, Dr. Ryan Lamb, medical director at UNC Rex Hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina, told USA Today in 2022. Capsules or tablets used to flavor water are an easy way to add a little bit of salt, as opposed to drinking sugary sports drinks. Eating foods that have a high water content, such as certain fruits and vegetables, can also keep you hydrated, Feldkircher said. The human body is always trying to regulate its internal temperature. When it's hot, the body cools itself through sweating. However, during heat waves, that can't happen as easily. When your sweat evaporates, it takes heat away from your body. But when it's humid, the sweat has nowhere to go and doesn't cool the body as effectively, Lamb said. The water can't evaporate into anywhere because it's already in the air, and so there's nowhere for the moisture to go, he said. Older people and young children have difficulty regulating their internal temperature, so having multiple fans directly blowing on them can make a big difference, Campbell said. When people are unable to regulate their body temperatures, they can begin to experience the effects of heat exhaustion. While many side effects of heat exhaustion can be mild, severe heat exhaustion, known as heat stroke, can turn deadly Heat stroke happens when your body becomes unable to control its internal temperature. But noticing signs of heat exhaustion can be challenging, Lamb said. Quote, The one unfortunate thing is that we don't necessarily see you progress from mild to moderate to severe, he said. So unfortunately, sometimes you could spend the afternoon with someone and then you turn around and realize they're severe and you didn't see any other symptoms, close quote. Hydration is also key when keeping pets cool, and it is vital for them to drink the right amount of water every day. It's, a be it's best to avoid taking pe pets outside during midday heat, according to Purina. During the hottest parts of the day, take play and exercise indoors. Have air conditioners and fans to cool your space on hot days, according to the American Kennel Club and Blue Cross. 
Good air circulation in the home is also important. Wetting a dog's coat can effectively cool them down, according to the Blue Cross. Even if your pup just dips its paws in the water, in the water will be absorbed and heat will be released through its paws. Genetic trait may delay onset of Alzheimer's, reported by Ken Altucker for the USA Today. Researchers have discovered a rare genetic trait that could delay the onset of Alzheimer's in people who face an overwhelming risk of developing the mind-robbing disease. A study published Wednesday in the New England Journal of Medicine reported that 27 people from an extended Colombian family who carried a genetic variant called Christchurch developed Alzheimer's disease several years later than expected. The findings build on prior research. Scientists from Mass General Brigham Healthcare System believe the evidence could be used to develop an Alzheimer's drug or medication that replicates the protective effects of the Christchurch genetic variant. Quote, we have enough evidence, and now the focus should be on trying to leverage this discovery to our therapies, close quote, said Dr. Joseph Arbodoledo Vasquez Velasquez, a scientist at Mass General Brigham, who co-authored the study. The research was isolated to South America, where the participants worked with a rare set of data. More than 1,000 members of an extended family in Colombia carry a genetic mutation that puts them at near certain risk of developing early-onset Alzheimer's disease. The symptoms usually begin when the relatives are in their mid-40s. The mutation carriers are part of an extended family of about 6,000 people. Using advances in genetic testing, doctors identified the inherited mutation that triggered early-onset Alzheimer's in these family members. It was called the Paisa mutation, named after the inhabitants of the region. From 1995 through 2022, researchers from the University of Antioquia collected detailed information about the family members who participated in a series of medical studies. Researchers knew that the mutation carriers typically developed memory and thinking problems in their mid-40s and typically died more than a decade later. In 2019, researchers discovered a woman who carried the Paisa mutation and did not experience symptoms of Alzheimer's until she reached her 70s, about three decades later than the symptoms have typically appeared among the Paisa mutation carriers. Genetic testing revealed this woman also had two copies of the Christchurch genetic variant. In the study published this week, researchers examined whether Christchurch offered extra protection to people who also have the Paisa mutation. They found 27 people with the Paisa mutation and one copy of the Christchurch variant. These individuals preserve normal memory and thinking longer than a comparable group who just had the Paisa mutation. The group that only had Paisa showed signs of disease at a median age of 47, while people who carried Christchurch and Paisa did not exhibit memory and thinking problems until they were 52, five years later. Arboleda Velasquez, who works as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, said his laboratory is using these study findings to develop potential antibody drugs to combat Alzheimer's disease. His goal is to begin testing medication in human clinical trials by 2026. We're at the middle of our broadcast, and typically we would read obituaries. There are no local obituaries today, but I am reading one for Willie Mays. Quote, say hey, kid, close quote, was one of baseball's best. And this is written by Bob Nightingale, um, a columnist for USA Today. Willie Mays, the say-hey kid of the 1950s and 1960s Giants fame, 
a home run slugger and center field star for most of his 23-year Major League Baseball career, died Tuesday at 93 after a short illness, the San Francisco Giants announced. Mays, almost inarguably the greatest living Hall of Famer, was to be honored Thursday evening when Major League Baseball stages a Giants-St. Louis Cardinals game at Birmingham's Rickfield, Rickwood Field, May's hometown and site of his Negro League career before making his Major League debut in 1948, one year after Jackie Robinson broke the league's color barrier. But Monday, he indicated he would not be able to make it and would enjoy the game from home. Mays got 95% of the vote when he was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame on the first ballot in 1975, 79, excuse me, after a career with 660 home runs, third all-time when he retired, 3,283 hits, two National League MVP awards, and a record-tying 24 All-Star Game appearances, two games played each year from 1959 to 1962. Mays' All-Star Game records include most at-bats, 75, most hits, 23, most runs, 20, and most stolen ba bases, 6. Quote, his incredible achievements and statistics do not begin to describe the awe that came with watching Willie Mays dominate the game in every way imaginable, Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred said in a statement Tuesday night. We will never forget this true giant on and off the field. On behalf of Major League Baseball, I extend my deepest condolences to Willie's family, his friends across our game, Giants fans everywhere, and his countless admirers across the world. Thursday's game at historic Rickwood Field was des designed to be a celebration of Willie Mays and his peers. With sadness in our hearts, it will now also serve as a national remembrance of an American who will forever remain on the short list of the most impactful individuals our great game has ever known. Close quote. Mays perhaps is best known for what is considered one of the greatest plays of all time, his running basket catch in the 1954 World Series for the New York Giants against the Cleveland Indians. It is known simply as the catch. Mays called it the throw. Game one was tied at 2-2 two to two at the Polo Grounds in New York City when Vic Wirtz hit a ball about 460 feet to dead center, appearing beyond Mays' reach. Mays, running full speed, caught the ball over his shoulder and, in one motion, threw it back to the infield. The Indians failed to score, and the Giants won the game on Dusty Rhodes' pinch homer in the 10th inning, sweeping the series for their first championship in 21 years. Quote, I knew Larry Doby would score from second if I didn't get the ball back quickly, Mays said. I scored lots of times from second base on a deep fly that was caught. That was the only thing I was worried about, close quote. The basket catch was Mays' trademark, catching fly balls at his waist instead of over his head. He learned that style by, while playing baseball in the Army after being drafted in the early 1950s. Quote, they invented the all-star game for Willie Mays, close quote, Hall of Famer Ted Williams once said. Mays won the 1994 NL MVP award in his first year back from the Army, hitting a league-leading 345 with 41 homers. He was a five-tool player who played the game with exuberance, he was revered by the Giants organization and beloved by his adopted city, New York. He was fo photographed frequently in his younger days, playing stickball with children in his Harlem neighborhood after he joined the New York Giants. If Mays hadn't missed nearly two full seasons in the Army or hadn't played his San Francisco home games at Windy Candlestick Park, 
longtime baseball observers believed he might have hit 800 homers. His center field contemporaries stretched from the New York Yankees' Joe DiMaggio, when Mays broke into the big league, to the Brooklyn Dodgers' Duke Snyder, to the Yankees' Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle. Mays, Snyder, and Mantle became the inspiration for the 1981 song Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, more commonly referred to as Talkin' Baseball by Terry Cashman. Mays learned to play the game from his father, Willie Sr., who was named after President William Howard Taft. Willie Mays Sr. played on all-black teams in the segregated South. Father and son played together on a semi-pro steel mill team when the younger Mays was 14. Quote, everyone knew him in, in Birmingham, Mays said. They called him Cat because he could run like a cat, very quick. When I played with him, I played center. He played left. I said, you play on the line. I'll take care of everything else. Close quote. <clears throat> May's favorite keepsake from all his years in baseball, he said, was his 1951 scouting report when he played for Class AAA Minneapolis, where he hit 477 with eight homers and 30 RBI in 35 games. Quote, Everything that he does is sensational, the report said. He has made the most spectacular catches, runs, and throws with the best of them. Sensational Negro Boy is the outstanding player in Minneapolis Club and probably in minor leagues for that matter. He hits to all fields and hits all pitches, close quote. He was assigned number 24 in his first year with the Giants and months later got the nickname Say Hey Kid. Quote, you see a guy, you say, hey man, say hey man, Mays said. Ted was the splinter. Joe was Jolton Joe. Stan was the man. Quote, I guess I hit a few home runs, and they said, there goes the say hey, kid. The San Francisco City Council established Willie May Days on May 24th of every year, celebrating the anniversary of his first day in the big leagues, May 24th, 1951. The Giants retired his uniform number 24 in 1972, and the address of their home stadium, AT&T Ballpark, is 24 Willie Mays Plaza. Back to local news, Mercedes Cab Company owner expands into Nantucket amid free bus ride promo, reported by Denise Coffey. Raphael Richter, owner of Mercedes Cab Company, Incorporated, acquired Valley Transportation Services of Massachusetts, Inc. Richard's transportation empire now includes Pilgrim Transit, Mayflower Trolley and Excursions, the Funk Bus, Cape Cab, Cape Destinations, and All Cape Truck Service. The company employs 180 year-round and 20 seasonal employees. Richter, who lives in Truro, estimates that his transportation businesses cover more than one million miles annually. That's four times around the Earth's equator. He said the acquisition of Valley Transportation was a natural one in terms of expanding the areas his companies serve beyond Cape Cod and southeastern Massachusetts. Quote, it was part of a methodical, steady process, Richter said. Valley Transportation Services contracts with the Nantucket Regional Transit Authority to provide nine routes to, ten to Nantucket visitors and, and year-round residents. Quote, we're trying to get people to ride the bus more, said the authority's administrator, Gary Roberts. There's very limited parking. Traffic gets to a standstill at times. More people riding the bus gets vehicles off the road, close quote. A grant from the State Department of Transportation has allowed passengers to ride free since April the 1st, Robert said. The grant will cover free transit through September the 1st. Ridership is up. So are passenger miles. In April, the increase was 58% was a 58% increase. In May, it rose to 64%. 
Roberts expects June, July, and August will be even higher with the influx of summer tourists, Roberts said. Houses sold in Barnstable County at median prices down 1.9% from the USA Today Network. Newly released data from Realtor.com for March shows that potential buyers and sellers in Barnstable County saw houses sell for lower than the previous month's median sales price of 642000 The median home sold for $630,000, an analysis of data from Realtor.com shows. That means March, the most recent f- month for which figures are available, was down 1.9% from February. Compared to March 2023, the medium home sales price was up 5.1% at $630,000 compared to $599,900. Realtor.com sources sales data from real estate deeds, resulting in a few months' delay to -to up-to-date data. The statistics don't include homes currently listed for sale and aren't directly comparable to listings data. Information on your local local housing market, along with other useful community data, is available at data.capecodtimes.com. Looking only at single-family homes, the 681000 median selling price in Barnstable County was down 2% in March, from $695,000 the month prior. Since March 2023, the sales price of single-family homes was up 9% from a median of $625,000. 51 single-family homes sold for $1 million or more during the month, compared to 114 recorded transactions of at least $1 million in March 2023. Condominiums and townhomes decreased by 4.6% in sales during March to a median of $429,000 to $449,900 in February. Compared to March 2023, the sales price of condominiums and townhomes was up 10% from $390,000. Ten condominiums or townhomes sold for $1 million or more during the month, compared to 14 recorded transactions of at least $1 million in March 2023. In March, the number of recorded sales in Barnstable County dropped by 69.9% since March 2023, from 1,008 to 303 All residential home sales totaled to $235.5 million. In Massachusetts, homes sold at a median of $555,890 during March, up 5.9% from $525,000 in February. There were 4,171 recorded sales across the state during March, down 65.3% from 12,034 recorded sales in March 2023. The total value of recorded residential home sales in Massachusetts decreased by 38.2% from $5 billion in February to $3.1 billion in March. Out of all residential homes in Massachusetts, 16.42% of homes sold for at least $1 million in March, up from 11.67% in March 2023. Sales prices of single-family homes across Massachusetts increased by 8.3% from a median of $535,587 in February to $580,000 in March. Since March 2023, the sales price of single-family homes across the state was up 14.4% from $507,000. Across the state, the sales price of condominiums and townhomes rose 2.9% 
from a median of $500,000 in February to $514,375 through March. The median sales price of condominiums and townhomes is up 8.3% from the median of $475,000 in March 2023. The median home sales price used in this report represents the midway point of all the houses or units listed over a given period of time. The median offers a more accurate view of what's happening in a market than an average sales price, which would mean taking the sum of all sales prices, then dividing them by the number of houses sold. The average can be skewed by one particularly low or high scale. L.A. Public Schools to Ban Cell Phones and Social Media, reported by Tao Nguyen for USA Today. Over 429,000 students in the nation's second-largest school district will be prohibited from using cell phones and social media platforms during the school day after the Los Angeles Unified School District Board passed the ban on Tuesday. The Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education voted 5-2, to two, approving a resolution to develop within 120 days a policy that bans student use of cell phones and social media platforms during the entire school day. The district policy will go into effect by January, according to the board. Quote, I think we're going to be on the vanguard here, and students and this entire city and country are going to benefit as a result, said board member Nick Melvoin, who proposed the resolution. The move is an attempt by educators to curb classroom distractions and protect students' mental health. K-12 through teachers in the U.S. have increasingly faced challenges over students' cell phone use, with one-third saying phone distraction is a, quote, major problem in their classroom, close quote, according to a Pew Research Center st- survey conducted in fall 2023. On Tuesday, California Governor Gavin Newsom expressed his support for efforts to restrict cell phone use in schools across the state. Newsom previously signed legislation in 2019 that allowed, but not required, districts to limit or ban smartphone use at schools. The governor echoed U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy's remarks published Monday in a New York Times opinion essay. Murthy called for safety warning labels similar to those on tobacco and alcohol products on social media platforms, citing what he he considers a mental health emergency among young people. Quote, As the Surgeon General affirmed, social media is harming the mental health of our youth, Newsom said in a statement Tuesday. Building on legislation I signed in 2019, I look forward to working with the legislature to restrict the use of smartphones during the school day. When children and teens are in school, they should focus, be focused on their studies, not their screens. Close quote. Parents and educators across the country have expressed growing concern over the impact of cell phones on young people including classroom distractions and potential mental health issues. As of, 20, as of the 2021-2022 school year, more than 76% of K-12 through public schools prohibit cell phone use in non-academic settings, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. But in recent years, lawmakers have considered legislation restricting smart phone use in schools. Last year, Florida became the first state to prohibit student phone use during class time and to block student access to social media on school Wi-Fi. In March, Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb signed a bill prohibiting students from using phones and other wireless devices in classrooms. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine signed a similar bill in May that requires school districts to establish a policy governing cell phone usage during school hours. As of June, 
Lawmakers in at least eight states have considered passing similar legislation, USA Today previously reported. And we have sport news for the Katuit Kettleers. Entitled Big 12 Player of the Year, Bellew is a top talent in Cape League, reported by Alan Gunn for the Cape Cod Times. The Katuit Kettleers center fielder Max Bellew went from appearing in only 15 games as a freshman to being named the Big 12 Player of the Year as a sophomore with the Texas Longhorns. Quote, I'm always just trying to compete with the guys, and I got something special out of it, Bellew said. Bellew became the fifth Texas player to be named Player of the Year and the first since Ivan Melendez in 2022. Melendez would be selected by the Arizona Diamondbacks in the second round of the Major, major League Baseball draft that same year. The journey to being Player of the Year, an all-Big 12 selection, and an all-American third-team pick wasn't without its struggles. There were high expectations for Bellew coming out of Alito High School. He was first team All-State and a four-year four letter, four letter winner at Conroe and Alita High Schools. He was ranked as the number two outfielder in Texas, Texas and the number 12 ranked player overall in his home state. Quote, I didn't really have a team growing up, but when I was introduced to Texas, I knew that's where I wanted to go, Bellew said. It's a special place. You walk in there and you feel the history, and it's fun to put on that uniform every day. As a freshman, there were glimpses of what Bellew could be. He made the most of his chances and batted 300 with six hits. Bellew then erupted as a sophomore. His 18 game runs were tied for first on the team, and he hit 341 with 14 doubles and 49 RBIs in 59 games. He started the season at 0 for 8 at the plate, but responded with 14 hits over the next 10 games. Quote, I love how you've got to prove yourself every day. It's competitive, and it's anyone's day every day, and you have to bring it, Bellew said of his passion for baseball. Bellew made his debut in the Cape Cod Baseball League on Saturday. He has had a hit in each of his first three games. Quote, He's a tremendous athlete. He has a gorgeous swing. He has the best outfield arm that we have and probably one of the best in the league, said Katuit manager Mike Roberts. I enjoy getting to watch him play. The 20-year-old racked up 112 putouts in Texas this season, which ranked sixth on the team and second for outfielders. His arms arm made opponents wary of seeking extra bases as he tallied five outfield assists. Quote, God has got to give them a lot of gifts first. It's got to get there. It's tough to get there, MLB, if you don't have some skills and gifts that stick out, Robert said. Quote, you want to see if they love game, if they enjoy practicing to improve and polish those skills, skills, and then when they go into professional baseball, can they handle those ups and downs, close quote. Bellew has handled adversity early in his Texas career. Longhorns head coach David Pierce picked Bellew as one of the most improved players, and that reflected on what he was able to do as a sophomore. Quote, I just value the trust that Coach Pierce has in me. He put me out there opening day and gave me a shot to show what I can do, Bellew said. Alongside his season accolades, Bellew has been invited to the upcoming USA Baseball Collegiate National Team training camp in Cary, North Carolina. The camp is considered one of the most prestigious events for 56 of the country's best non-draft eligible players. It means his stay on Cape Cod will be interrupted for a few weeks, but the faith he paid in Texas and the patience he has shown in his development has continued to open doors with a pathway to success. When asked if he's chasing a career as a professional baseball player, Bellew quickly said, that's my goal. We've come to the end of our broadcast today. 
I am Daphne, and so glad to have been able to read the Cape Cod Times for Thursday, the 20th of June. Have a great weekend. Stay cool, stay hydrated, and keep your pets inside in the middle of the day.